was very generally male, generally pale, a construction industry. And uh, we need a total cultural revolution to actually change that. I've been passionate about that for a long time. I'm very pleased to be uh, appointed by the Construction Industry Council to lead the diversity panel. And I was also very heartened that the uh, Construction Leadership Council, under Peter Hansford's guidance, the advisor uh, on construction and government, has recognised the importance of the lack of diversity in our industry and has asked the panel to lead on the action plan regarding those particular issues. I'm very clear that we have not got a diverse industry and we're not going to create one overnight, but we do have to grow one. And so very much my passion is about ensuring that we engage young people, and particularly school children, in this uh, industry and um, opening their eyes to the diverse and amazing range of job opportunities that there are within it. Um, it's quite obvious that there's no silver bullet that's going to change things immediately. But this is a societal problem in that you know, perceptions are obviously skewed from a very young age, often by parents, again by educationists, that you know, this is a job for the boys. Um, and in terms of diversity, we're not thinking purely in terms of gender, because we also have an appallingly low record of black and minority ethnic uh, population in, in the industry. You know, it's even worse than um, the, the gender issue. About 12% females, but only 6% professional women in the industry. It goes down to about 3% uh, when we're talking about ethnic minorities. Um, and they don't even count or you know, record the number of disabled people. Um, or the number of um, people from gay and lesbian backgrounds. So we have a, a real challenge on our hands, and there are going to be many different strategies that we need to actually overcome uh, this. But I do strongly believe that we have to tackle the image of the industry. And um, I was appalled last week, I was invited to speak uh, at an event which was about how we inspire, inspire and motivate young people to read in my mentor on the way, and one of the biggest articles that day was about how a yob had been wolf whistling at a uh, a young woman uh, from a building site and how he considered that she was acting above her station because she reported him for, uh, for, for harassing her. And, and, uh, uh, and so I think we still have a real problem with perceptions. We know that the Smith Institute last year published its report, Women in Construction Building Futures, and Meg Manning the, uh, championed that. And it was quite horrifying, actually, to read that report because it shows the amount of harassment and discrimination that still exists, particularly at site level in our industry, and we actually have got to find a way of outlawing it. Um, so there are many challenges, and the 21 or so professional bodies that are represented around the table of the diversity panel are all using uh, quite innovative uh, means by which they and their institutes are trying to tackle the discrimination that is evident. Some of it is, is um, you know, not very visible and people aren't always aware that they're discriminating. But uh, by raising awareness amongst our members, by having action plans in each institute and joining those together to form a pyramid of real action to demonstrate that diverse businesses are sound businesses. Diversity means business. The more women you have on your boards, the more likely it is that your business is going to be successful, the more you will represent your uh, population that you're serving. So it makes good business sense to be diverse. We don't have to argue that point, but what we need to do is change the behaviours and the cultures of the industry. For a start, it's not possible, really, um, to be site-based and raise a family. We've got to get employers thinking about how you can make our industry much more family-friendly. And what's good for women is good for everybody. Uh, how many dads would like to go and see their children you know, in the school play? I've been plenty of them with their hands up too. So I think we need to look at it from a very, very much holistic point of view. But a cultural revolution is necessary. And uh, in my view, we do it from both ends. From enticing the four-year-olds who are very happy to play Lego, build, build sand castles on the beach and play Minecraft, and maybe interested in you know, the digital side of building uh, to capture their interest, but also to get more of those women who are very brilliant in our industry up to the senior positions and on boards where they can start influencing that culture and change those companies' views in the way that they present themselves and the way that they look after their workforce. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, just before we move on to Elaine, I was going to say if you are tweeting, uh, we have a hashtag of CapSig Diversity, and if you want to use that one. Um, but why, uh, let, let's carry on with Elaine, please. Is it going to be questions at the end? Yeah, uh, yeah. We're, we're going to get into a discussion yeah. after this section. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you for inviting me on tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, 
course, I'd like to you know, endorse and second everything Bridget has said, and particularly the, the idea of the, the cultural revolution in construction, mm -hmm. because uh, I think that the word revolution probably does uh, encapsulate what is needed. It's an action across the board and from pretty much everyone. Um, at Construction Manager, we are the magazine for the Charles Institute of Building, and I think it's worth pointing out that um, this is an issue the industry has been aware of and has been discussing for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, I went back and found uh, quite a major article that we'd done in the year 2000, you know, discussing the lack of um, diversity, lack of women in the industry, lack of um, black and uh, minority ethnic people in the industry back in 2000. And then in 2008, I believe, there were a couple of major reports looking at uh, diversity in construction and looking back at what progress had been made in, in the preceding years and concluding that actually not much had happened. So, that, um, so I remember writing about the whole issue in, in 2009 and being quite shocked at uh, some of the things I found then in 2009 because what people were sort of expressing to me at that time, I think we had a little sort of bone table discussion quickly, was that the industry felt a bit like a, a club that had put a sign up on the door saying everybody welcome, but once you got inside, you found it wasn't quite that straightforward. And um, I remember speaking to one woman in particular who was um, working for a very well-known company, the company you what we've all heard of, and the sort of company you would expect to have very good policies on the equality and promotion and ensuring the level of playing field. And she actually, I remember speaking to her on the phone and, and she was in tears <laughs> um, describing her experiences of feeling marginalized, uh, or feeling that she just wasn't quite a member of the club that she had been offered membership of, uh, and that um, the, the sort of career progression she assumed would be hers um, you know, wasn't obviously going to happen. I think that was in 2009, and obviously since then, I think things have changed in the way that we're all talking about diversity more, that the arguments in, in favour of having more diverse industry have been pretty much understood and accepted. And I think things are improving on, on a lot of fronts. Um, I think um, we are seeing more visibility of, of women in, in prominent roles in the industry. It's certainly easier for me as a journalist trying to represent the diversity of the industry to um, bring up a company and you know, there will be um, you know, plenty of, of, of women spokespeople, um, certainly more than we've been in the past. So for me as a journalist, it feels a little bit easier to represent in a more diverse industry. But at the same time, we know the statistics are, are suddenly not moving. And uh, I think that even though we're all aware of the issue, we're all discussing the issue, um, there's conferences around the issue, uh, I think it, it basically just needs more action on, on more fronts. And, um, more effort from the companies involved, from communicators and journalists such as ourselves, and from you know, the industry representative institutions, to, to, to really say this is a this is a priority. Thank you, Elaine. Liz. Thank you, um, I wanted to say first of all around diversity. I'm, I'm I talk mostly about this I'm from looking at it from the position of women in construction because that's what I understand best and, um, and know most about. So forgive me if that's a little bias um, in some of my comments. But I, I see it as um, fundamentally a business and a leadership issue. It's not a woman's problem. And neither do I see diversity you know, as a minority group's problem. It's a, it's a business and leadership issue. And actually, from a PR perspective, from a communicator's perspective, PR, you know, wants to and should be represented at board level, managing around you know, business management and leadership. And so, actually, as PR professionals, we have a really, really direct um, relationship with this issue. I think there are um, opportunities 
at every level for communicators and PR people to, um, to, to take action on this. I was looking at um, how we make it much more visible where See, I don't, the clients I come across don't have any problems finding um, strong women for, they don't have any problems identifying talent. They don't have any problems managing um, women's performance. What they really have a problem with is knowing how and when to promote and how to grab and retain that talent in their organisations. It seems that women get to a certain stage in their careers and then just disappear or not promoted to the next level. And that's where a lot of the organisations I work with struggle. And as a communication professional, as a PR professional, I believe that's exactly where we can step in and actually start talking about that more, celebrating some of those examples of where it has worked, um, and actually making it much more visible, showing that it is possible, it is work, it does work. But when I was looking at this again the other day, I suddenly thought, gosh, haven't I changed my tune? <laughs> Because in 1997, I can remember, <laughs> I can remember I wrote, we're very excited, I worked for the NHBC, I was head of comms of the NHBC in the late 90s, and I wrote a press release about the fact that we'd appointed our first ever female building inspector. And in the late 90s, it was novel and it was exciting. And actually, if you appointed a woman in your business, there was a lot of um, uh, PR and promotion that went around that. And then suddenly, it just became, Sort of something you never did talk about. It almost became embarrassing. And certainly, there were many years where I advised clients not to communicate about having women in their business because it was almost drawing attention to the fact that they hadn't had the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually a reputational risk to draw attention to this. And this continued for quite some time. And then I think we just all fell asleep. And then it's required a major skills crisis, which everyone knew was it coming anyway, for us all to suddenly wake up again and go, oh, actually, we should be out there celebrating women. And I, I saw this, the construction news um, from last November. I don't think that would have been possible from a PR perspective 12 months ago. I think something, a little, a little switch has been flicked and suddenly, you know, the media's woken up to this, we've woken up to it, and it's suddenly the issue du jour. And there actually does become a responsibility then of communicators to, to grab that and to work with it and to actually start putting out some stronger stories. The other point I would make is um, I, I read an interview uh, with an engineer at WSP and she was saying um, what had made a difference in their organisation and they had relatively good track record on uh, employing women engineers. And she was saying actually one of the key issues was communication. Communication at every stage through the recruitment process, through um, the mentoring, um, through at every stage of a woman's career in that organisation, the quality of the communication and the support that was given um, for good and open communication, that's made a tangible difference to whether women felt they could stay in the club, as you described it. And she said, actually, to make a long-term difference, you need two things. You need data and you need stories. You need to change a culture. You need lots of great stories based on data, based on proof, so not half real stuff that proves some of the stuff that the research tells us. <laughs> that keeping women in your organisation makes a difference at all these different levels. And actually, that's where I feel as PR people, as professionals, as professional communicators, we have a fundamental responsibility to be those storytellers, to pull in the data. And actually, we should never get to that point where this becomes unacceptable again. Thank you. Chrissy? Uh, it's been lovely to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of it, so I can just focus on the bits. Um, so there's just a few things. One, um, just want to point out some of the stats that I would slightly disagree with that they're not moving. They are moving. It's just in the wrong direction. We've dropped from 13% women in the industry down to 11. And it was 12, it's still going. So that worries me. Um, we do have some stats around disability, 14.9%, which when you hold up against the UK working average of disability, 15.9, that looks pretty good. 
And she realised that the construction industry does not recruit people in with a disability. Oh no, we create our own and we're kind enough to continue to employ them afterwards. So it's, it's troubling in areas. Um, some of the things that I wanted to talk about, one, I, I wanted to throw you a, a communications bit because um, one thing that wasn't mentioned is I am MCIOB, I'm a you know, grubby little builder, quite frankly, and setting out engineer and then site manager, so your world is, isn't one I know as well. But one of the things that I find very interesting is that the companies that I see, especially over the front page, talking about diversity, are the ones that I get the most phone calls from as a business from people that work within them, saying, actually, this is my story, this is how I feel, I don't feel that the company is doing what they're saying they're going to do. What I find, though, is the companies that I never see on the papers are the ones that people talk to me about doing the best. And there seems to be this really big divide between those that say and those that do. And I'm not saying that those that say never do, but I'm saying that those that really do tend to count it as just what we do. There's no need to talk about it. So I suppose if I have an appeal to you, you should probably have said this before my next point, but we rounded up with it. But my appeal would be go find those that do. Don't just respond to those that are telling you, because usually they're doing it for PR and and that can be a really good reason, I don't want to ruin my audience here, but it's not necessarily always the best reason. But one of the things that I'm really interested in, so when I'm not running my business, I'm doing a PhD looking at mainstream inequality in the construction industry. And one of the things that I'm mostly interested in is actually what we do about equality. What we do once we've decided that there is a problem, and we found out that that problem's there, and then we start moving on to, well, how do we change that problem? And actually, if you look at research around equalities over the past 20, 30 years, not just within the construction sector, but outside of it, what you find is that it hasn't really been proven. What you find is a lot of people recognising a problem, suggesting a solution, and then going, well, what have we done well? There's um, a symptom we call distant cheerleading, which is everyone, again, I mean, I will open my hands up and say, as a business, we offer equality and diversity training. I work hard at it, I happen to think it's particularly good. I also know that a longitudinal research study out of America, um, over 15 years by Cabal, found that actually, um, in the organisations they looked at, there was a decrease in women by around 10%, um, a decrease in men by around 5 but most importantly, a decrease in women from black communities by 15% in the companies that have had prolonged periods of equality training without anything behind them. So what we really need to think about now, I think, is actually what we're doing. Not that we're doing something, because this idea that just because we're doing something it will lead to good, I think can be a dangerous one. And the best way that I think I can put that is if we think about it in terms of health and safety. Um, I worked on a site once where we made sure that everyone wore glasses on the site. Brilliant idea in principle, safety glasses of course. Um, not so great when you give everyone the cheapest glasses. In fact, what we do is visually impair half our site. So we need to think about, does it work? And so the big thing that we've been working on at the moment is an idea called organisational justice, which is actually how fair people perceive the workplace to be. And so this is um, a theory that's been going about for about 30 years. And where we bring equality into it is the idea that if you have an organisation and you have a man and a woman who are um, equal to one another in all senses of the word, then people are generally quite happy. In fact, usually the kind of man is less happy because he thinks the woman shouldn't be on to that. But we're not going to dwell on that. But actually then, what happens if that woman's come into the organisation from, um, say, a Women in Work programme? What happens if the perception is she's been given a leg up that wasn't common to men? What happens also if you put that in an environment where people are working over 70 hours a week, as most people are in site management and setting out engineering, when they're underpaid, they haven't seen pay rises, when they're overstressed, when they start to see another group is being given a leg up, something that they're not getting, actually what we start to see is the deviant behaviour. What we start to see is people actually becoming more discriminatory, not less. So for me, what we need to do for this culture shift is think really about the impact of what we're doing and not simply just pat ourselves on the back because we think we're doing something. Okay, want to take Open it up to questions. Yeah, well. absolutely. absolutely. Um, before I open it up, I thought I would just chuck in with one question for myself. Um, and particularly on the eve of um, uh, the general election, and there being various um, thoughts around positive discrimination, you just touched on that in the end. Um, I wanted to open that up as the first question. Um, should there be more done from a positive discrimination perspective, either through legislation or other routes, to try and change some of these problems that you talked about? 
I'm happy to kick off on that. I think that the initiative to actually have 30% of all boards, Lutsu boards, female, is a, is a really good starting point. Because I'm convinced that if you have more female input and minority input uh, at, at the decision making and the leadership end of business, then you actually start to change cultures inside organisations. Um, so, you know, that's something that I'm very supportive of. I mean, I'm talking to an organisation called Women on Boards particularly to see how we can prepare women in our industry who often are reluctant, they're mid-career, and not quite sure whether they want to go to that next stage. And an organisation like Women on Boards can give people the confidence and the, the toolkit, if you like, to enable them to present themselves as credible candidates for other non-executive positions or executive positions where they can really positively impact on the culture of an organisation. So I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on that. Obviously, most women would rather be promoted on merit. Uh, and I think we've seen that across all, all fields um, in society. I mean, I look sometimes at some of the politicians um, and think, hang on a minute, I'm not sure that person's there on merit. Hopefully, if I had to endure them speaking for half an hour, I realise we don't really talk about that. So I think that it's got to be on merit, but I think we actually should have a push. And I would particularly like to see it on the board. Um, yes, no, I, I tend to agree with that, and, and uh, on that point, um, in terms of the Davis report and, and representation, representation of boards, uh, yeah, I probably would subscribe to that argument. And I think um, generally, I think uh, <coughs> we've all been sort of talking about um, diversity and having diversity policies, and yet at the same time, they, they haven't really been, been shifting or our behaviours and our thought patterns, then yes, we do have to think, is it time to think about moving to certain measures that, that you might call positive um, discrimination. I think, or perhaps not positive discrimination, but recognising that treating people equally uh, and the same is necessarily not the answer. It's, it's more um, treating people differently in, in some ways, to, to recognise that there are differences, that um, women do approach problems differently uh, in the same work uh, scenario, then they might come up with, with non-male solutions, and um, that's you know, not a sign that they're, they're not ready for promotion, it's just a sign that, uh, uh, that the company needs to sort of look at how they're approaching things differently. And um, so, Yes, I, I think if, if um, my positive discrimination you mean not simply treating people equally and expecting um, you know, the same um, people, people to play by the same rules all the time, then, then I think that is something that some companies need, need to look at in, in terms of um, um, you know, equipment and, and um, promotion. I was going to let Chrissy answer this because I think she's got to struggle so much. Um, so there's a few things. One, um, there was the point about capability, and I find this very interesting because whenever we talk about minority groups, particularly um, black and white <coughs> ethnic groups and women, the question of capability comes up time and time again. So what I found very interesting is the CITB board, for example, um, that was predominantly male for many, many years. We've got our first female member about seven years ago. Well, we were very happy about it. This year they selected that board and they reduced it down to eight people and five of them were women. And the first thing that most people said to me was, but as long as they're capable. No one asked about the three men and their capability. <laughs> and I think that that's a really interesting point. Women have to prove themselves. Men are accepted as good enough straight away. So we have to think about our thinking. And that comes on to when we're asking people to come onto boards, when we're asking people to put themselves forward. Predominantly, we are writing the job application for a man not for women. So we shouldn't be too surprised when most people get applications from men. We need to start gender mainstreaming our, our questions that we're asking people, our introductions, and how we're getting people on board. And this was shown um, in Wales, um, oh, I forget the name, but I will find out who needs it. The sports governments there, they did an exercise with the board, and they wrote that in a gender mainstream way. So they wrote it very differently to the way that they would, and they got 60% of their applications on a sports board for women. So it's quite interesting, it can be done, but we need to think about it more. 
Um, the point made around boards, very, very interesting. So something um, I found has happened throughout my career, and having looked at research and spoken to women, I found this happened a lot. When I'm on a board and I'm the only woman there, this strange thing happens where I will say something and everyone will smile so sweetly at me and then we'll move on. And then 10 minutes later, someone will repeat what I said word for word. And when I look at the minutes later, there's no mention of what I'd said originally. Now the reason I put this down to gender is because that has never, ever happened to me on a mixed board. Not once. And it has consistently happened to me on predominantly male boards. One of the other things I want to talk about is that when I am the only woman on a board, I feel like a token. So if I feel like a token, I can only expect that someone else is thinking I am one, which is probably why this happened. The interesting thing about 30% women, which is where we see real change come from, is even if you put those women there without due regard for where they've been, they stop being tokens. So you'll actually get more movement just from the different perspective of having women on that board than you will men. So, you know, I'm kind of out with that, but it's about critical mass. Um, the third thing, I thought it was really important to say that um, positive discrimination, of course, is illegal in this country, but we do have positive action. And I find that quite often it is, um, it's used as an argument against diversity rather than it actually being used as something to increase diversity. So, I'm just going to start the argument. I'd just like to add that um, when the CITV did the big promotion about how most of the board were women, I had two thoughts actually that came into my mind. First was, well, good that they caught up, because the Trustmark board has um, been for a long time all women out of the total board of seven. So I think, ha, ha, following your footsteps. Um, my second thought was actually, well, um, they're representing skills and recruitment into the industry, which and the HR and skills piece is a heavily female-dominated area. So actually, I've been very surprised that it wasn't uh, women-dominated, actually, and it should be, because they're exactly the sort of people who are embedded in the industry with the HR and skills uh, knowledge um, to, to guide the CITV. So, yeah, good. Um, as regards quotas and that side of things, I'm personally uncomfortable um, because of the backlash issue that you touched on because I think our quotas in isolation uh, are, are dangerous. I think it's a, a cultural thing that it needs more than that. That said, the longer it goes on and the slower the progress, the more impatient and maybe you think, do you know what, maybe we've got to really, really shake it up and do something that's going to be on people first <laughs> in order to make a change. So I'm just getting a bit grumpy or foolish about it, really. Can I just give you a sort of paraphrase quote that helps your, your point out there? Yeah. Uh, Norway, back in, I think it's 2003, introduced 40% quotas of the boards. And five years later, they came back and did some brilliant interviews that pretty much went along this line. And they asked people on these boards, are you happy that it happened? And they said, no, it's a terrible idea. Okay, um, do you, would you like it to happen again? Are you happy now that it's happened? So, sorry, first of all, are you happy at the time? Are you happy now? No, I still don't like it. Has it made improvement? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to have questions from the floor. Yeah, Alan Jones, I work for Gallifer Tribe with the seventh largest construction group. Uh, your comment about wolf whistling um, was actually a bit worse than what you said. One of the girls actually climbed down and physically blocked on the path. But I'm surprised none of the papers picked up uh, any, anything from the considered constructors because obviously we're members. Yeah. About two weeks ago, we picked up an award from them. Uh, I mean, most big contractors, if that happened, somebody would that's subject to immediate dismissal. Absolutely. And I think you'll find that's just the smaller contractors doing some house renovations somewhere where they, they're just sort of not restraining on the ground yet. Yeah. But we, we do what I mean, we've got about 45 staff on our site, of which about 10 of them. Admittedly, four or five are covered, but we've got a female health and safety manager, two policy players, and a structural engineer. And the structural engineer is Polish, and she said when she did her university course in Poland, over half the students were women, whereas it does tend to be the minority here. Um, we do a lot of school presentations, we do what we can to, we, we try and take a female members of staff along and take a picture job girls as well. But I think even among careers and staff at schools, it's that they, they don't have a, any of the 
perception of modern industry. And you hit the nail on the head when you said it's not family friendly because we do, over the years, a number of female site engineers will come in, 10 years, each of 21, 22, 10 years down the road, the best fight an office job somewhere because it, it, it's hard enough family life for a bloke, let alone, let alone a woman. So what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we can change that really. But it, there's not so many women out there because so many go into teaching and, and banking and medicine and law. So you've got much now of all the females to, uh, to attract. I just wonder if you have any comment on that. Well, that's the irony, is that we are actually in competition in this industry for the best talent there is out there. And as you say, there are more other more attractive sectors for the go to. So I think, you know, the stats are that we're, we've lost 400,000 people during this recession. We know that we have an aging demographic. We know we're going to need another quarter of a million people before 2020. We know that in order to fill those posts, we need at least a quarter of those to be women. So what we're saying is we're like Turkey's version for Christmas. If you don't make changes, fundamental changes, to the way we organize, the way we work, then we actually are not going to attract them because they're going to go to more family-friendly industries. So I think there's an imperative on our industry now to think differently. And you have to ask the question, why is it necessary to do the work the way we do it? You know, have technology um, not have an impact on what we do? Are there other ways of doing the work? Uh, are there different ways in which we can organize our resources? With off-site manufacturing, BIM, and all these other things that are coming in now, we have an opportunity to look at the processes and the workflows in perhaps different ways. And companies that are making those changes are finding that they're actually finding they're having better retention. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm very pleased to say I was surprised to see that we did some research with a major HR company that supplies for the industry. And they said, if you ask women in the industry, are you happy with the industry? 76% of women in our industry say, they, yes, they are satisfied. Not only are they satisfied, but they would recommend the industry to their daughter, or to a friend, or, or to, a, to, a, to a colleague. So I think that that's a good place to be. It's not all, it's not all dark. You know, there are actually some, some good stories here. Um, and women's pay has risen. Uh, 6% a year over the last 10 years. And in fact, when you look at the pay gap, which is significant, um, gender pay gap across all sectors is about 19%, and construction is about 12%. So there's some things that construction industry have actually done you know, to attract and to keep women. But our biggest challenge is, and, and somebody you know, said it to me in the vernacular of the industry, it's all very well filling the hopper, they say to me, but the pipe is leaking the other end. You know, you're going out there to schools attracting young people to come into the industry. If you're not keeping women, who want to stay. And the, the issues are around maternity leave, they're around the supporting processes when, you, when women want to come back. I'll give you an example. I spoke to a headhunter the other day who talked about the most terrific project manager she'd ever come across. Fantastic, fantastic woman. Um, and she took time off um, for her to have her daughter. And uh, she was sending jobs to her, you know, saying, you know, now the baby's eight months, ten months, you know, you've got your child, go organize all these jobs. And she had a coffee with her, and, and, and she said, look, I just haven't, I haven't got it anymore. I can't do it. I've lost my confidence. And there was issues about, when you have a career break, some industries are harder than others to go back to, uh, because you have to build up your confidence, you have to get back on that, that, sort of, that sort of harsh environment in a way, which it sort of tears you a little bit when you're actually leaving your infant at home anyway. And some of the more progressive companies, and I know one, which I won't mention, but they're a competitor in voice, um, and, and they have got something called a return ship. And that is aimed at supporting their women who come back after a career break to have children, is giving them confidence building, is giving them a mentor, it's easing their timing, it's supporting them for six months to have flexible time. It's hand-holding, really, to build back up that confidence. And when you think of the investment in that person through their training, their development, that they've already given, it's a no-brainer to support them for six months after they come back to work and enable them to settle back in again. So I think there's ways and means in which we can tackle this, but it does require us to think differently. I think um, yeah. Yeah. That might have been the company I used to work for. Um, yeah. One of my colleagues had a second baby. Yeah. And I think after three months she came back, it was like one or two days a month. Yeah. yeah. Just to keep ahead yeah. of things yeah. and know what was happening. So yeah. it wasn't a complete change. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It, it is a big deal to go back to work in any industry, but I think in this industry particularly, it, can, it can be particularly difficult. I I'd agree with that, but what I would like to say is the research constantly comes back to saying about a third of women leave the sector, all different levels of architecture, structure, engineering, site level, um, because of pregnancy. Actually, two thirds leave because of the environment that they're in. And this is for me the, the bigger problem. I'm, 
And it's funny because we identify so strongly with our industry because we have to. When you are working 70 hours a week, Monday to Friday, occasionally Saturday, when you're under pressure constantly in such a hard environment as site is, brilliant, don't get me wrong, I loved it, but it was hard. You have to identify what you're doing. If you'd have asked me when I worked on site, did I enjoy it, I would have told you how much I loved it. If you'd have asked me have I ever faced discrimination, I would have told you point by point that I had, and I would all, I'd have given you some short strip for suggesting it. Of course, oh bless me in it, I looked back a little bit later and realised that the mountains of discrimination I'd faced, the sexual harassment that I pass off as banter, and I do mean and to include my boss getting naked in front of me and asking me if I wanted it over the drawing desk. That's just banter to women that work on site. The fact that five out of my ten bosses is propositioned me is just banter on site. And that's then that's some of the, the dark realities, but actually they're not even the things that bother you. The things that bother you are the fact that actually every single time I start a new job, I prove myself again. And I don't mean that in some kind of cute way. I mean that as in I get two months having to sort out the drawing files because as I put it by one as one of my bosses put it to me, we weren't too sure how you'd get on with the lads on Cyprus. Now, if you'd have asked me at the beginning, I'd have told them probably just as fine as I have for the last five years, except for if they give me any gym. But they don't ask. I get the drawing register again. And you don't want to, if it's a new team, pull the woman card. The language is designed against us, and we don't want to talk about it because that will make us victims. And that's the thing about women that work on site. We are certainly not victims. And sometimes I've known two women site managers that were pregnant, and that's an easy out. That's an easy reason to not go back. You haven't failed, you've made different choices around your family. Whenever I left firms, um, three of them I left because my bosses admitted to me they'd made decisions that were poor for my career on the basis of my gender, very openly admitted. One of them, I got a really poor job for six months because they thought I could form a relationship with a client and they had best of returners to pay. I didn't even have a boyfriend at the time, let alone thinking about that. But when I was asked when I left those companies, I didn't say, well, the blatant gender discrimination and lack of credibility. I said, someone else got me more money. Because quite frankly, I don't want to carry that stigma around me. I can talk about it now. And trust me, a lot of the women that will be working in the industry feel exactly the same as I do, and won't speak up for exactly those same reasons. So I think we have to be really careful when we talk about pregnancy as the reason that women are leaving. Because it's not. It's just a safer reason for us to give. I'll add a bit to that. Um, I had discussions with, so my name's Rebecca, I'm um, an architect, I've been working in architecture for close to 15 years and I, um, I'm kind of embedded in the BIM community now because I've kind of moved into that space because I'm a digital expert and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and I've been really passionate about drawing in women in very digital roles because, I mean, you look at women in construction, obviously we know there's in small numbers. You draw it down into specialisms and the numbers drop even further. So my passion is actually trying to get women to understand that, the, you know, obviously the way that we're using technology in construction is going to draw more of them in. And I think that's a really good pull. Um, there's a couple of ways I want to go with this, but the first one is for me, I never noticed a, a, a problem until I started moving into senior roles. So I was very, I mean, the, the numbers, and you look at the numbers, and the numbers are quite even for graduates, and it's fine going into architecture, etc. And it was, it was fine for me, and I had a good time with it. Um, moved to the UK, I'm Australian, so culturally very, very, very different. Um, and it's one thing I actually want some comments on, because I've done a lot of work in Australia, I've done work here, and I know I've been connected to the US, and very, very, very different discussions when it comes to diversity and construction, very different. Um, and I find it, uh, to be frank, in the UK is a, is slightly behind mm -hmm. in terms of the way that we, because I've lived here a long time, deal with it. Um, so in the, the one, we had a meeting today actually because I chair a women in BIM group, right? So there's a you know there's all these kind of women for groups, etc., which are fantastic. One thing I want to do is remove all of them and just bring everyone together. I don't know how. Um, the second one is trying to work out how to create a position or a space to encourage women to retain um, their positions in, in senior roles like, like you discussed, women on boards, etc. And that's something I'm really passionate about because I've actually removed myself from working for organisations because I'd rather work for myself, make money for myself and I have to deal with the bullshit, I'll be honest, and sorry for my language, that I've had to deal with. So, and we had a discussion today about it, um, you know, and it's something that we're really passionate about. But 
the, the question is, and I'm kind of ranting a bit, um, is how do we not, um, not be negative? How do we create something that's really positive mm -hmm. about bringing women into the industry? Because I don't want to talk about how shit it was and, you know, I was treated like this, and we've all, we've all been there. Um, how do we actually change the way that um, the way that it's perceived and to encourage women positively in these senior positions? Because that's where I want to be. And I know everybody I'm talking to wants to be in the same space. So. Absolutely. I think um, I'm going to jump in something I, I want to link into this. It's not a direct answer, but it's linked to it. It's, I think um, I've been looking very closely at what the army did. Uh, how they tackled their recruitment problem and their problem of getting more women into the armed forces and what the Shah did. Um, they did some research, and see if this sounds familiar. Um, they found that most people um, considered soldiering to be a dirty, mucky business out in the open um, in all weathers with a group of testosterone fueled males who were racist, homophobic, sexist, and that it was a, a very aggressive. Um, environment. Um, and so they realised that actually promoting soldiering, promoting being a soldier, joining the army in its in its you know original way was automatically going to put off the perceptions of it were so negative it was going to put off a lot of women and others groups joining the army. So and you'll probably recall it actually, it's been a campaign they've run for a long time. They changed the strategy entirely. It was become a medic become an IT expert, become a logistics expert, drive a truck, you know, um, become a cook. <laughs> they honed in on really, really specific roles, which suddenly became open to anyone and had a totally different set of perceptions around them, still for shiny. <laughs> um, but actually what they opened up was the diversity of uh, the, the industry itself and <laughs> diversity roles in that, in that case. And actually, it had an immediate knock-on effect in terms of gender diversity, ethnic groups, and others as well. And I think it's a really interesting parallel for us. And um, when I'm sat in the construction industry, as uh, a construction leadership council discussions, and we all sit round, and we're about improving reputation construction. <laughs> um, and everyone says, yes, yes, we need this big promotional campaign, a big PR campaign about coming to work in construction. And CITB should spearhead it, and it should all be about construction. It's like, no, actually, that's the equivalent of join the British Army to be a soldier. No, let's actually identify, and this is what the point is, all the really positive, yeah. wonderful opportunities there are, which would actually attract a much broader range of people. And that is a whole different set of stories for us to tell. And I mean, encouraging, I mean, for me, it's about finding the women that want to tell those stories. And we had this discussion today that maybe that's where we take it, that we find the women that are in these senior positions yeah. that want to tell their stories and that want to encourage other women to, to retain um, those roles. Yeah. But and the ladies, they're there. You find them. Yeah. Not yeah. Right. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> we just need those stories to come through. I don't know if anybody saw the ICE's fantastic... Uh, video called Happy Engineers. Oh, so yeah. fantastic. I think yeah, that's a great way to, to actually promote engineering because mm -hmm. it was just the whole diversity of ages mm -hmm. uh, and just the whole thing was there and it was just so uh, you know, uplifting really and uh, a great way to sell that as a career into into schools. Can I just respond yeah. to the point yeah. you made about yeah. uh, women into senior roles? It's a, a really interesting but we've been doing some training for the past four or five years now for a couple of hundred women through. And um, and so what we find is there's two main problems when attracting women into um, to these roles. One, there's the problems from the organisation itself. So if you look at the research, um, it consistently shows that we have these different opinions of men and women. So a lovely piece of research that went on in America, same CV sent out to professors. So this is wider than just the construction industry. Professors at university, only difference, women's name, male's name. On the male one, definitely want to employ them, want to move them forward, can see them in that role. With the women's name, they liked them an awful lot, but they just weren't ready. Right? And we find this a lot. We look at the potential of men, we look at the history of women, which I think harks back to, you know, when we find out there's a little pay us some money and <laughs> what she's been up to, she's been a tarnished family. But that has lingered with us. 
So we need to understand that. We need to understand how our conscious bias, and as well as that mainstreaming, we need to understand that everyone seems to think diversity is everyone else's problem. Because I'm not sexist, I'm not racist, I'm not unconscious bias, I'm a good <coughs> person. It's those other people. I actually think what we all, every one of us, part of a protected characteristic group or minor, minority group, sorry, or not, needs to do is go, actually, do you know what? I am. I don't mean to be, but growing up in a society that I do, with the images that are portrayed to me constantly, of course some of that's rubbed off. And it's okay for me to have the bad cause. I've just got to recognise them and tackle them. So there's that one hand. But on the other hand, those, those images, they do two things. They also tell us as women other stuff. They tell us that we have to be polite and kind and ask permission, that we shouldn't go for things, we should wait till we're invited. And quite frankly, when we don't do that, we're often seen as a range of wonderful names that just aren't polite. But one of the things that we find when we're doing this training is the amount of women that one wants to be confidently about themselves. And I am talking about women that do massive deals within their companies, can do their jobs brilliantly well. But you ask them to talk about them, not we, the team, them individually. They don't do it as well. You ask them to put themselves forward for jobs. They don't put themselves forward unless they've hit every mark. And of course, their male colleagues are putting themselves forward at around 40%. Even more interestingly, the viewing panel that's interviewing that person probably put themselves forward at 70% as well, so they're expecting that person to fight for that job because they won't have got it. The man's going to do that at 70%. The woman's sitting there going, well, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't ticked all the boxes. I'll answer the questions they ask me. And then sit back and wonder why we didn't get the jobs. There's two things, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we have to fix the women, we certainly don't. We need what they're bringing to the table. We just need them to understand the rules of the games in larger organisations. Because if we look at some of the past presidents, quite proud to say, CIOB excluded, um, but the past presidents of other institutes like RICA, IBA, um, WICS, ICE, nearly all of the female past presidents came from their own institutional practice, from their own small businesses, where most of the men came from larger organisations. That, for me, is interesting and it tells a story. You can get that with it as long as you do it on your own, which tells me that businesses have got an awful long way to go. We've got to start looking at what we can really do and tie into strategy. Well, the issue is not... Um, sorry, one sorry. more thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the issue is not about um, the fact that we um, need to retain women in those roles. The issue is that we need to, because I mean, I'm independent now, we need to actually ensure that there are strong women in, in leadership roles in large organisations, otherwise it won't change. Yeah, they drop out. Yeah. Yeah, 50 50 in architecture, yeah. but part two, Reba, you dropped from 25% women at part two to 19% in the space of about two years. Yeah. That drops off. It's shocking. We are losing women disproportionately mm. every step, every level of this industry. And the same goes for BME communities. Not so much for disability, we seem to be gaining, but for the wrong reasons, not what we're introducing in. Okay. We have up to uh, some more questions. Please. Um, it's interesting, um, obviously, you said earlier, Christy, about um, just because we're doing something that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing. Um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and then we were talking uh, about um, what, we can be, you know, what we can be doing as communicators. I think you were saying that. Um, so my question is really, I suppose, for Liz and for Elaine. Um, as communicators, um, how do you think we can help the, the issue of, of diversity in this cultural revolution that we, we think we need? What do you think we need to do more of? Um, about well, <laughs> get my list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I really uh, was thinking about this. And so just uh, some ideas. Um, first of all, um, don't wait for CITV, Construction Leadership Council, or any other group to suddenly decide that they're going to go out there and start telling positive stories. Whatever organisations you work for, or whoever client, whatever clients you're working with, you know, um, go and find the doers, as Chris has described them, um, and and you know get out there and and talk about specific skills and roles and opportunities, not women in construction. Okay, so that would be my first uh, top tip. Um, look at communications at every stage. Um, so if you're, certainly if you're an in-house communications uh, manager, director, 
we've got the opportunity to look at um, what is the communications piece around uh, recruitment and the language that's used and the whole recruitment and uh, process, then what's happening in terms of um, ongoing sort of management of, of female and, and other diverse groups within the organisation and the communication support that's put in. Because I hop back to this point about John, the, the lady at WSP was talking about this. You know, she said it made such a massive difference. It was reassurance at every single stage and open communication in a way that men didn't seem to need as much, but the women did. So that it made an, it, it was a communication responsibility. So there we go. Um, I think find the data, tell you know, the data and the stories thing. Find, find the data, find the proof, um, and talk about that. Um, talk about um, how it's possible, enter awards, <laughs> facilitate internal communications around culture and shared values and beliefs and, and, and sort of tackling those you know, unspoken biases that we all have. I think the more that we have an open discussion about culture and corporate culture and our beliefs in an organisation, actually the quicker you flush out those that perhaps it doesn't quite jar with. Um, and you'll you know, drive about. So I think that's a fundamental communications opportunity. Um, I think, as I said, when I very first started, I see this as a um, senior management board level communications interaction. This is not a press officer putting out a press release about a new female employee like I did in 1997. It shifted entirely. Um, yeah, I've got some great ideas there, yeah. there thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yes, it's not about putting out the press release about the individual um, female employee, but, but there is still a, a role in, in getting more women and more uh, black and ethnic minority people featured in, in magazines such as um, I, I edit. So, uh, you know, it's, it's great to put people forward, um, with, not with stories, here's a woman or of an Asian man, but when they're talking about some other subject and they're talking about BIM, when they're talking about um, sustainability, you know, perhaps it's thinking beyond the first person that comes to mind for, for you know, who's going to be the conference spokesperson on this issue. Um, then I the think that there are, all, are also stories to be told about, as, as Chrissy said, the companies that are, that are doing and you know, perhaps those stories aren't coming forward because I think that there are some companies in the industry who are thinking about things like unconscious bias and who are sort of changing their recruitment practices to, you know, um, you know, as far as they can, eliminate unconscious bias. I was speaking to Turner and Townsend about this and their graduate uh, recruitment manager came in from another industry and looked at the figures but I think they were, at the time, their intake was 13% female. And uh, I asked what, what, what percentage would be in each, they didn't know. So that it was another problem. But um, after putting through, uh, putting all their um, um, recruiting staff through uh, some form of training and changing their processes so that they were asking for um, application forms without names or I'm not quite sure how they did it, but certainly they were trying to um, remove that bias. It went up to 40% of them uh, in, in their graduate equipment intake. So I think there are those kinds of stories out there. We want to hear more of them. And, and also they are data driven. And, and, you know, if, yeah. if you've got the data, you've got a better platform for yeah. taking action and for you know, communicating it. So I think uh, the, the data point is quite important. I think um, there, there are hooks like International Women's Day um, in yeah. March. Yeah. There are some PR hooks that uh, people can use. Yeah, um, Jane Duncan, the president elect yeah. of Freebo, did a brilliant yeah. cam campaign called See Me, Join Me, where yeah. you know, thousands and thousands of women across the world sort of held up to See Me, Join Me and showed what they do. And I think that was quite, quite powerful in terms of the range of people um, that there are yeah. in the industry. And, uh, I yeah, it's I think think idea. definitely think visual. Rather than words, um, you know, images, video, yes, videos, fantastic. I think positive images sometimes are much more powerful. 
Um, and so for many people, you know, they feel sometimes a little bit aggrieved that it's all about gender and there's actually nobody shouting for, for them. You know, so we're very, very conscious of that. Um, and, and we think that it's so important um, to, to raise these issues because you know, we're actually ignoring otherwise a, a large, large a proportion of our population in the UK are saying, oh, we don't really do uh, construction. I mean, I was in my former life um, principal of private education college, which happened to do quite a lot of construction training in a part of South East London, which is a large Sikh community. And I wondered why we had so many Sikh students in carpentry and joinery. Dome. It is a, you know, it's, it's a cultural trait. Sikhs do carpentry and joinery. And I was totally ignorant of that and thought, wow, we must be doing something fantastic because the Sikh students are coming to learn carpentry and joinery. And I think sometimes we actually have to address the fact that culture, the influences of parents, the choices that they make for what, what they do, there are cultural influences in there. And try as we may, we sometimes cannot overcome those cultural influences. We can try to understand them, and we, try, and we can try to make people aware of them. And by being aware, just as Turner and Townsend became aware that they actually had bias in their selection process and did something proactive about it, they actually get better results as, as, as a result of that. We're very conscious of that. Um, our next meeting, Stonewall are going to come and present to us because it's a big issue in the construction industry. It's almost as bad as, you know, being, being gay in the football industry, something that wasn't mentioned because of the, 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 the abuse that people got. And I think that we have an issue with, uh, with lesbian and, and, and gay people in our industry that, you know, they're not necessarily happy to speak out about the sexuality because they feel discrimination. So we're tackling that one at our next meeting. So we're very much conscious of all of the, the issues. You, you did mention earlier about the lack of um ethnic minorities yeah. and women, but how can you um, get the same gay and lesbian people? Because it's hard to tell. You can't it look is, at somebody yeah, and tell yeah, yeah. you know, boy, and you can only most people, as you say, yeah. tend to keep quiet about it. That's right, it. that's right. But it's, a, it's about making sure, it's about data again. It's trying to, to trying to gather the data in the first place. So one of the things we've agreed across all of our professional bodies is that we will actually start asking more questions when people join us as members and then share our data across our institutions so that we actually can start measuring whether things are getting any better. Should they wish to give that? Should they wish to give it? And of course, everybody's right not to disclose. But you can only work in an imperfect world. But unless you, you try to, to start measuring it, you'll never actually so It's just it. when we do our induction, you ask about any medical conditions. Yes, and yeah. if people have say, psychiatric problems, they'd be yeah. very reluctant or they yeah. actually yeah. very yeah. reluctant to say it because they think it might, you know, jeopardize the life of yeah. 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 So people are reluctant to mention these things. But it's about education and it's about making sure the companies are aware, you know, and, and have the HR um, uh, specialists that can bring in the knowledge about what those conditions mean and why they may not be in any way uh, a difficult thing to manage in the construction environment. So knowledge is power. What we're trying to do with the diversity panel is to give ourselves that knowledge and make the uh, CIC panel the sort of the, the source of information for companies, for people to say, what might be the barriers for me to be successful in this industry? What do I need to be able to do? And from a recruitment point of view, from a HR specialist point of view, what do they need to be aware of to eliminate conscious bias? So there's an element of protection that's still needed for this culture. We have to remember that um, two thirds of people from LGBT communities have faced violence on the basis mm. of their LGBT status alone, physical violence, let alone when you start to talk about that. Mm. If you're encouraging and asking people to respond to that question, then you need to create a culture where they feel safe and able to. Because that's one of the main differences. It's not a visible characteristic. Mm. I think mean, having choice with when we hide our, our gender or our BME yeah. status. We do with our religion, and we do with our sexual orientation. Um, and I just wanted to mention another thing. We focus very much on diversity and in terms of what these companies can do. But what I would just like to kind of get to thinking about as well is the benefits that it adds as well. Um, the benefit to having women around the table. Women think slightly differently to men. In the main, in groups, not every woman. And whether that's nature or nurture, quite frankly, the jury's still out, and I'm not too sure at this moment it matters. What we know is that it is true. And what we, and don't worry, I'm particularly more like male thinking apparently, um, in what I enjoy to do, but not necessarily in, in the way that I act. So, for example, women are more like, well, men are more likely to take a financial risk. That's why we see so many on the stock exchange. Women are more likely to take what we call a social risk. That means that if we see something in our organisations that isn't working well, we speak up about it. We say, well, if we just did this bit different. But if you're in an entirely male environment, what that can do is make people think that you're complaining for no reason. It's not valued, and that can mean that you don't progress up as much. But actually, if it's taken the other way and used well, 
then it can be a benefit to your company. There's plenty of examples. There's an example of a housing association because of um, the broad spectrum of ethnicities they have, which match the communities that they were working with. They redesigned the houses that they built. They understood that actually a large proportion of the people that they were now having in their houses lived in bigger extended families, less similar to the nuclear families we particularly tend to have within the traditional British family. And so they made bigger sinks in their homes. They made um, bigger living arrangements with walls which fitted those um, families better and made them shine. It added to their bottom lines. And as much as I think you've got to believe in it for the bottom line to, and the business case to mean anything in the first place, I think the bottom line is something you've got to sell. This, this stuff makes sense. It's good for people. It can make money as well. But you do it with a good heart. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, um, so you're saying a lot about the differences between genders and people from different ethnic backgrounds. A CIO being report found that 49% of people in the construction industry think corruption is common. Do you think if there was a balance, for, a balance between men and women, that might change? I, I do. The research would certainly suggest so. Just simple things like um, um, increasing women on boards means people read the papers beforehand and turn up on time. Um, women are more likely to stick to rules than men are. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I'm not necessarily speaking to the women. I've had the women on my right quite <laughs> But those hundreds of times a different person. And again, this isn't to say that every woman does that. But, but the point is, women are more likely to stick to rules and believe in the rules and believe in the wider social good. Men are more likely to what we call empire build, think about themselves more. Which doesn't mean every man does it. Um, but the point is that what we tend to do when we're separated into groups is we act like the group that we're in. Because we want to fit in. If I'm in a group predominantly of women, I will pretend that I like things that are fluffy more than I do because I don't want to be an outcast. I do like kittens in the main, but puppies are not supposed to be. <laughs> Obviously, I'm exaggerating the point there, but the point is that when we have people that we presume are like, what we do is we act to the stereotype slightly more so we will fit in to the group. Okay? And so if we can break down those stereotypes, we can break down groupthink, and we can break down the fact that it's okay to do those sorts of things. So definitely, not just women, but actually diversity in itself and fire representation. Diversity in business in our organisations is diversity of ideas, which means a, a better business result. It's proven time and time and time again. It, it, that, that, that is no longer a dismissive interview. And you're right, it's about telling the stories that prove that, underpinned with the data and the examples, and then the, the pictures that bring it all to life. And, and sort of resonate with us. I would just say that it is proven when well managed. When badly managed, actually, diversity can be bad for you. You just bung a load of people in a room, smile sweetly, and then get on with it. Actually, it doesn't necessarily sound like better. You have to manage it and you have to support it. Mm -hmm. Derek? Yeah, please. I'm conscious of time. Yeah. Um, I'd like to draw it to a conclusion in sort of three or four minutes. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel if they could ask. The PR industry to do one thing mm -hmm. that would help them in their role. Mm -hmm. If they could do that in 30 seconds each, um, I'd give you a chance to think about it and then perhaps who wants to go first? I, I'm going to go first. Yeah. Uh, I get tired of turning on my TV set and seeing the construction industry portrayed in a very negative fashion. Uh, programs about cowboy builders, about pensioners being ripped off by town academy teams and various things. And my favourite program. Uh, and I will admit to being a female and being very weepy when I, when I watch it, is DIY SOS, because there are builders doing fantastic things for the benefits of their community. Um, and it always brings a tear, tear to my eye because they're usually you know, really, really deserving causes. But it's, it's, it, would you try to help us to portray positive images of our industry? Because unfortunately, there are plenty of opportunities for people to show uh, negative images of our industry. And without those positive images, we haven't got much of a chance of attracting the young, talented people that we want to attract out of schools, colleges, and universities to come in and to, to you know to carry the baton for that next generation. Because we really are getting to squeaking pips time when so many people are going to retire. We really do need that younger generation to come in and want to be part of this fantastic um, industry that we all serve. Well, one successful series that had was the one about what was the highways agency in the road yeah. workers. And um, highways agency, there were didn't know whether to do it or not, but it's been a huge success yeah. and they haven't made another series. Yeah. Been a lot of positive feedback on that. 
Um, I think one thing I, I would say is, is data, actually, because I, I get the feeling that there's, there is data out there in the industry that isn't necessarily released to, to the media. Um, I was speaking to do the UK CG um, recently, <laughs> and um, I, I know they've had a diversity panel for a little while, and I'm not really aware of any outputs from that panel uh, in terms of data and survey. But apparently, they, they tell me that the, the, the most recent um, current survey data it is due to come out uh, in a couple of months, so it'll be definitely interesting to see that. Uh, and I think, you know, because we do live and work in a sort of male-dominated industry, a lot of decision makers do like, you know, hard evidence, uh, and uh, I think um, uh, evidence, you know, and data in, in, in whatever form, it, it's always good for making the argument. And also to look at other countries, you know, you mentioned your construction in Europe from Poland, I get the impression that, you know, because of the economic downturn in Spain, that there's quite a lot of Women Spanish engineers coming over here. I mean, you see them on the streets sometimes. So uh, I think you know any sort of comparisons of, of other countries and uh, of operations in other countries uh, would help to make the argument as well. I think. Um, okay. So all of the above. In particular, yes, I, I, I think I've been to pause. Yes, it's, um, let's not denigrate. The small builders, and you assumed that it was a small job you build on a domestic site who did the wolf whistling. And I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but I think we mustn't make this assumption. I represent Trustmark, and we are talking about you know, some of the country's very best tradesmen and builders and working to government and door standards, and not really a beacon. I see them day in, day out, they're doing the most amazing stuff. So, actually, I uh, you know, do celebrate that. Um, but pulling together the world of PR. And construction and property. <laughs> I think there's quite an interesting thing that I see, which is that actually there are relatively few women and ethnic minorities doing PR, <laughs> um, certainly within our industry. And those that are don't stay for very long. They go off and do, you know, more lucrative PR, consumer <laughs> brands or something like that. And actually, the PR industry itself has a diversity issue. And actually, what I think I would like to see, and CIPR has been championing this mentoring uh, for women um, to get more women to, to rise to a more senior level and to stay within the PR industry. So I'd like to see that flooded with CAPSIC members <laughs> <laughs> so that we get the benefit of all that mentoring and all that wisdom and all those people staying within construction and property because if we get high quality communicators within our industry, we will all reap the benefits of it. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Hang around, is <laughs> my advice. Um, obviously not now, because what I do is jib on about diversity, but back when I was, although I'd often be asked to, to talk with things, people liked me. I think it was because I was short and female, so quite often there'd be photos taken. But I always say, please, 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 make me an engineer, make me a builder first, make me a woman second. That was the problem. People kept asking me what I thought about women on site. I didn't really didn't know. I just never wanted to build things. It wasn't my question to really be answered in that way. I was following my career path. I wasn't trying to be a pioneer. And it can be hard to be labelled with that big, heavy question. I can't speak on the behalf of so many other women. I just want to some concrete. So, and also, it can be hard because I would have not knowingly, but accidentally lied and said that things were fine. So I think if you're going to report about what the state is for women, that needs to be based upon the research that's out there. I think we need to stop forcing our minorities into corners, making it their problem and making them talk about it. Yeah. 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 Yeah